Hello and welcome to Series Capades. My name is Chuck. In the previous episode, we discussed an entire episode's worth of watering topics. If you missed it, I would highly recommend watching it. Watching that episode is not required to fully understand this episode, but it would help. They are related, but the videos are self-contained, so there's no need to panic. In this episode, we're going to talk about dormancy in succulent plants. Intro. In gardening, dormancy refers to when a plant enters a state of little or no metabolic activity. This is in response to unfavorable growing conditions such as extreme temperatures, drought, not enough light, and other extreme weather conditions. To put it simply, when succulents are dormant, they enter a state of no growth or little growth until favorable conditions return. Unfortunately, favorable is subjective. This varies across genera and a lot of times even between species in the same genus. For instance, I find that the Echeveria agavoides, elegans, and a few others, they break out of their winter dormancy a lot earlier than the other plants, especially particularly the Gibiflora hybrids. So right now we are approaching the end of summer and it looks like the Gibifloras are now just putting out flower stalks. What's the significance of that? You'll find out later in this episode. And you know what? I think the FAQ format of the previous episode worked really well in terms of exposing or going through a lot of knowledge in such a short time. So I'm going to do that again in this episode. What is dormancy? Well, I gave you a short version a couple minutes ago. Dormancy is basically what we refer to the period or the state of slow growth. This is basically the plant's reaction to unfavorable conditions. I know that we're talking about succulents here, but dormancy is more obvious in plants in temperate climates. For instance, the deciduous trees. These are the trees that shed off their leaves during autumn or fall and grow them back in spring. We also see this in seeds. So as long as they're doing nothing, as long as they're dry, they are dormant. But as soon as you expose them to favorable growing conditions such as humidity and the right temperature, then they would start sprouting and growing. So it's pretty much the same thing. So again, to sum it up, it is basically the plant just doing nothing and waiting until the conditions improve. Basically, the goal here is to prevent death. It's just doing the bare minimum metabolic activity, just trying to get by. Hey, I saw this dormancy table going around online. Does that mean they go dormant either in winter or summer only? Not quite, but that's a good start. The thing about dormancy is that it is based on thresholds. So different plants have different thresholds. And by threshold, I'm referring to the upper and lower limit in terms of temperature that they could take. In the chart, you'll see that Echeveria is listed under the winter dormant plants, which seems to imply that they are summer growers. What you should realize here though is that majority of the comfortable range for Echeverias are found closer to summer. But again, that depends on your own climate because in some areas, summer is a lot harsher while in other areas, summer is mild. From experience, I've noticed that Echeverias are comfortable within the 15 to 35 degrees Celsius range and outside of that range, whether the upper end or lower end, they, they would show signs of being dormant. In my climate, it's very convenient and clear cut because in winter, the temperature drops low enough that it triggers the dormancy of the Echeveria plants. While in summer, during the very hot parts of it, the temperature rises high enough, just above the upper limit of Echeveria, that they start going dormant too. Is it then possible that summer dormant plants do not go dormant in summer? Yes, pretty much. Take Aeoniums for instance. I noticed that they enjoy a temperature range of somewhere between 5 to 25 degrees Celsius. And of course, that's a lot lower than the Echeveria comfortable temperature range. You could say that they tend to enjoy the lower parts of the spectrum of the temperature spread, which is why people tend to classify them under the category of winter growers. Then again, if your winter is really harsh in that it's below freezing, then that's beyond the minimum limit, minimum the lower limit of the Aeonium comfortable range which means that they're going to be dormant anyway and vice versa. So going back to the example of Echeverias, although I did mention that they tend to be not dormant until 35 degrees Celsius, if your temperatures rise above that and 
tends to be more than 35 for more than a day or so, a few days, then your echeveres will still go dormant. In fact, above 30, they start closing up, protecting themselves from the heat, and yeah, that's a pretty clear-cut sign that they are dormant right there. Basically, what I'm saying is that the climates vary so much between regions, and even within the same city, there can be varying types of climates. And besides, the seasons are not the same everywhere. I live in a place where my climate would be considered somewhere equivalent to the USDA hardiness zone of 10A or 10B, somewhere in between. It can get cold, but not as cold as, say, Zone 7. What's this hardiness zone you're talking about? The USDA hardiness zone or the United States Department of Agriculture hardiness zone is a standard that helps gardeners figure out which plants works in a specific climate. And these zones are based on an annual minimum winter temperature. The problem with hardiness zone numbers is that this only indicates the lowest temperature your area can get. It does not take into account how hot it can get in your area. How do we account for that then? This is where the heat index comes in. The heat index is a product of air temperature and relative humidity. And this two combined is what's known as apparent temperature. Now this explains why the air temperature and what it feels like can vary because there's more to temperature than just air temperature. So say if there's a lots of moisture or humidity in the air then it would feel a lot colder or hotter depending on the air temperature. This explains why in weather apps, the air temperature is different from the feels like section, if you're familiar with that. What happens when a plant goes dormant? We have already discussed the reduced metabolic activity, and now let's get to the more interesting stuff. So unlike deciduous plants or trees, succulents do not shed all of their leaves when they go dormant. And the way that I see it, it seems like when they are dormant, they are stuck in autumn mode. Remember how deciduous plants in autumn have this vibrant display of colors? That's pretty much what succulents are doing while they're dormant. So what goes on here is that photosynthesis still happens and there's an overproduction of sugars in the plant. However, unlike the rest of the year, most of them get stored within the plant leaves rather than being used up by the plant or distributed everywhere. On the plant. Again, this is because the plant is starting to reduce its activity. But in addition to that, most of the sugars are stuck within the leaves because the nodes of the leaves are starting to constrict when it's autumn, thereby clogging a lot of the plant sugars in the leaves, leaving no place for them to go. Now, the result of this sugar staying in the leaves means that a lot of the sugars break down within the leaves. And when they break down in the presence of light, this produces this pigments called anthocyanins and anthocyanins are those pigments that produce all of those reds, blues, purples, and blacks. During normal operation, the plant produces chlorophyll and carotenoids. Chlorophyll, of course, provides the green coloring of the plant, while carotenoids provide the orange, yellows, and browns. In autumn-like conditions, the chlorophyll production is reduced, which then reveals the carotenoids in the leaves, which explains why in deciduous trees, the leaves start turning yellow. Now, if you add anthocyanins to the mix, then that means that you have the yellows, oranges, in addition to the reds, blues, purples, pinks, and all of those colors. Now, you could imagine that there's only going to be an explosion of color. In succulent circles, this is better known as stress colors. I made a video about it a while back and you might want to refer to it if you want to learn more about stress colors. Apart from what we have discussed so far, something else I find interesting here is the transition period between active growth and dormancy. Polycarpic plants or plants that can push out flower stalks as a separate offset tend to push out flowers when they get out of dormancy. So if you're in a place where both heat and cold can make a plant go dormant, then you could expect at least two sets of flowering throughout the year. Another interesting phenomenon during autumn is that the plant tends to have reduced foliar growth or reduced growth of the leaves. Although during that period, the roots can still grow as normal. And that, in my opinion, makes autumn the best time to do some repotting or transplanting because you're pretty sure that the plant would not grow any larger or at least it wouldn't grow as much while you're still giving a chance for the plant to replenish or regrow its roots. This is also why I prefer doing a lot of my landscaping during autumn. Aside from, of course, the ambient temperatures, it's very comfortable. But that way, the plants would not be growing larger and I could reserve the space for the design based on their, based on their size 
or if you're doing tight arrangement or small bowl arrangements then you are able to retain the design as is for a bit longer so they would not be growing fast enough to outgrow or compete with the other plants yet. Your design or at least their relative sizes would remain intact until the next growing period. How do I make a plant go dormant? Based on what we have learned earlier, triggering dormancy in a plant is as simple as just pushing them out of their comfort zone. Whether that be the cold end or the hot end of the spectrum, doesn't matter. That's what you have to do. You will have to manipulate temperature, humidity, and the amount of light for this to be very effective. Of the three, temperature and humidity seems to be having the largest effect on the plant as long as they have enough light. So that might be something that you have to keep in mind. Because of course, they'll still need a bit of light to sustain themselves, especially for producing plant sugars, because they won't be able to create energy in the dark. This is also why you'll notice that plants during the colder months, during winter, tend to be leggy, at a slower rate or they tend to stretch a lot slower compared to during the warmer months. With that in mind, I would highly suggest that you trigger dormancy during the cold end of the spectrum. A good range should be just a few degrees above freezing point. Basically, you just want to avoid freezing your plants but at the same time you want to inhibit any growth. Because otherwise, if you go for the hot end, then you're risking dehydration and burning. And there's a lot of other problems associated with the heat, let's say insects, because a lot of them are active during the warmer months. So triggering cold dormancy is your best bet. There are many ways to achieve this, but in all of these scenarios, what you'll want to do is to be able to control the environment. And as such, you would need to have a controlled environment, which usually means greenhouses, grow lights and stuff like that and depending on your climate you might even need air conditioning or heating to maintain an ideal temperature range but basically this kind of setups allow you to simulate the different seasons on your own schedule and not necessarily follow your natural climate this is probably an essential technique when you're trying to create your own hybrids because you would want to sync their flowering cycles that way you're able to pollinate different specimens together but as you can see in my garden I just tend to follow the natural cycles I do not have greenhouses at most I have the shade cloth I use the shade cloth to dampen the hot end of summer so I might need a bit of help explaining the setups so to that end here is Alex from Windowsill Succulents take it away Alex Hi Joe and thanks for having me on your channel so I'm Alex and I grow succulents in the northwest of England so in the northern hemisphere and we're in the depths of winter right now and I thought, um, well Chuck and I thought it would be interesting for me to give my current experiences of dormancy in a different hemisphere. So I have a kind of wide range of growing environments actually. So I have a windowsill which you can see here which is mainly um, lower light tolerant plants. So things like, even though this is south facing, we have so little light in, in winter that um, I can only really keep these guys here. So things like the Echeverias and Crisulas are actually in separate grow tents. Um, so these get here get exposed to quite cool temperatures at night and fairly warm during the day. So it acts a bit like a greenhouse, I guess. Um, but it loses heat very quickly because it's only a single glazed window. So it's quite tricky actually trying to work out which ones of these are dormant and which ones aren't because Hawthier are quite, quite slow growing you know, at the best of times. Um, so it's quite difficult to kind of keep an eye on them and see oh, which ones are dormant and which ones aren't. Um, it's far more clear cut in the grow tents that I own, so I have two like I mentioned. The first one has quite a powerful light in it called a, a Migro 100. I have it turned down um, to around, I think it's at about 75 watts at the moment, but that's quite powerful really. That's um, equivalent to around 300 watts of T5. Uh, so that's quite a lot. Um, so everything in there is pretty much actively growing. Um, Aeoniums are growing well. Um, even the Echeveries are flowering. Um, my Chrysulas, such as the Buddhist Temple, are growing. So uh, everything pretty much is growing in there. And they're, I think, just opportunistic. So even though the day lengths are shorter, I've got it set on a timer to around 12 hours. Um, so that's obviously less than what they would get in summer. but because it's quite a strong intense light and because it's quite warm in there they all seem to just be taking the opportunity just to just to keep growing so the other grow tent that i have has a, a weaker light in it it has around uh, 28 to 30 watts of power 
Um, so A, it's not producing as much heat, so it's a little bit cooler in that tent. And because the light intensity is nowhere near as strong, um, most of those in there just aren't really growing at all, or if they are, I can't notice. So I would probably call those fairly dormant, even though it's, it, you know, it's still fairly warm in there. Um, the other env environment that I have is a greenhouse, so that just gets exposed to whatever temperatures we have outside. Um, so our winters are fairly mild here up in the northwest. We're up at about um, 8 degrees today Celsius, but we tend to go down to about minus 5-ish, um, probably I'd say was the lowest temperatures we would get in winter. The odd times we'll go down to like minus 10, um, but it's quite unusual, so the succulents seem to be able to do quite well out there most of the time. I have had some casualties last year, um, but with a frost cloth on and stuff like that, they seem to do okay. But all of those are completely dormant, so I've not been watering them one bit. Um, the combination of the cold weather and the short day lengths that we have, so around eight to nine hours I think we're currently on, just means they completely shut down. So I really hope that's been an interesting perspective for you and I'll hand you back to Chuck. Thanks again, Chuck. Thanks, Alex. So there's a fair amount of things that we have to learn about dormancy. And what I've shown you is everything in a nutshell. If you read more into it, you'll find more details about it. But I think you just need to know the simplified version. I hope you learned a lot from this and I hope you check out Alex's channel as well. He has been producing a lot of videos about the equipment he's using. So if you are curious about it, then make sure to check out his videos. And of course, he also has his succulent content. So I'm pretty sure if you're watching my channel, you're already probably watching his. But if not, make sure to subscribe. I'm pretty sure you'll find his other videos interesting as well. Now that we have discussed dormancy, I think it is a good segue to move into flowering first. So for the next episode, I'll be focusing on flowering in plants and everything to do with flower stalks. And the motivation behind this is that I'm seeing that a lot of people are still being confused by flower stalks and pops on offsets. And I wrote an article about it, you could check out the link in the description or right here. I published it in my website. It contains photos and instructions that would teach you how to differentiate between flower stalks and pops. So if you think this is something that would be interesting to you, make sure to like this video and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially Oscarino, Julie Seal, Snap Kui, Gloria Ninotti, Camila Arvaez, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Q2, Jesse May, and Ronin Perez. Thank you so much. Without your help, a lot of this is not possible. You should also check out my website, seriescapes.com. I have a plant shop and Seriescapedia section right there. I push updates once in a while, so make sure to check back from time to time. And finally, follow me on Instagram, that's at Seriescapades. I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag DailyEcheveria.